UFC 297, Strickland versus Duplessis takes place this weekend, and I'm going to go through the entire card, starting with the early prelims, ending with the main events, giving my prediction and breakdown for every single fight on the card, starting with the early prelim opener of Malcolm Gordon versus Jimmy Flick. Very low-level flyweight fight to kick off the card. I am leaning towards Malcolm Gordon here over Jimmy Flick for multiple reasons. One, little bit of a physicality advantage at flyweight over Jimmy Flick, in my opinion. Two... Reach advantage at flyweight. He's got three inches of reach over Jimmy Flick. I think that's going to be an advantage if they are going to be on the feet, specifically because Malcolm Gordon does like to throw straight punches. I think that will be in his favor. I think one of them is going to get finished. You know, Malcolm Gordon's a little bit chinny here and there. He can be submitted. Jimmy Flick, also a little bit chinny here and there. He can submit people. Um... I feel like Jimmy Flick does have a chance to submit Malcolm Gordon, but Malcolm Gordon was looking really good against Mohamed Makayev. Now, I know everyone does until round three, but Malcolm Gordon was looking good in the grappling exchanges at times against Mal against uh, Mohamed Makayev and even had control time over Makayev in certain moments, winning grappling exchanges with a guy like Makayev. Now, do I think if he stays on the ground with Jimmy Flick that he's going to win? No, but I do like the fact that Makayev isn't really a jiu-jitsu guy, which is why he often doesn't really finish people early in fights on the ground. He takes him till the third where he slows him down and wears him out. But he is a really good wrestler. Malcolm Gordon held his own in the wrestling. If he can use that ability to not let this go to the ground, I think he's going to be in for a massive advantage over Jimmy Flick. And I think on the feet, he does just have an advantage over Jimmy Flick. I rate the people he's lost to a lot more than the people Jimmy Flick has lost to. Uh, Jimmy Flick has lost to, of course... A few people by finish. Alessandro Costa, Charles Johnson. He actually beat, uh, beat Cody Durden, but I don't think Cody Durden was ever that good, um, in all honesty. Malcolm Gordon, you know, he's lost to some good fighters, you know. Jake Hadley, not all that what we found out, you know what I mean? We maybe thought he would have been something, but he didn't really turn out to be all that. But he got hurt to the body in that fight. Before that, he had a terrible weight cut. So going to the body from Jake Hadley was a very, very smart move. Um, he actually missed weight for that fight, Malcolm Gordon. That's how bad his weight cut was. So very smart for Hadley got, uh, to go to the body. Makaya finished him in the third round, but he held his own in that fight very, very well. Um, he beat Dennis Bondar due to a broken arm, beat Francisco Figueiredo by decision, and he also lost a fight to Amir Al-Bazi by submission, who's now a top contender. Got finished by Suma Dwerji, but these aren't schmucks like Jimmy Flick loses to. So I'm going to go with Malcolm Gordon. I think he has an advantage in this fight, and I think he's going to win this one by TKO in the second round. Straight punches on the feet, something along those lines. We move on. Up the card. Jasmine Jasuda Vicious versus Priscilla Kakuera, I believe it is. I can't see it because she's not actually on the page. Um, but I am going to go with Jasmine Jasuda Vicious. I think she's lost to better opponents than Priscilla Kakuera now. I wish I could access Priscilla Kakuera's page here. But Jasmine Jasuda Vicious, I think she's just a better fighter in general. Looked better against Miranda Maverick than Priscilla Kakuera did. Um, actually, I think she beat Miranda Maverick, didn't she? Whereas Priscilla Kakuera ended up losing that fight by submission in the third round. Jasmine Jasuda Vicious actually got a win over Miranda Maverick. So I think this is going to be a good fight. The way I see this is they're both very tough and scrappy women. But the way Jasuda Vicious does it is a lot more technical than the way Priscilla Kakuera does it. Now, does Kakuera have a power advantage? Yes. But I think in her last fight, Jasuda Vicious showed that she has a really good chin. And I think Jasuda Vicious' wars that she's had have shown a higher level of skill than Priscilla Kakuera's wars that she's had. And I think that Jasuda Vicious has gone to war with better opponents in the women's divisions than Priscilla Kakuera has. Yi Yon Kim turned out to be nothing special whatsoever. Um, losing to Molly McCann. That's how bad she was. So, um, you know, I'm going to go with uh, Jasmine Jasuda Vicious. She's also in Canada. This is something she's been waiting for her entire career. She's younger in her career. She's actually younger in age as well, but I mainly mean that in terms of her career, in terms of how much damage she's taken, how much time she's got to evolve, how long she's been in the sport for. So I'm going to go Jasmine Jasuda Vicious. I think she wins this one, and she's got a three-inch reach advantage at the same height. So I'm going Jasmine Jasuda Vicious. We move on. Up the card, Johan Liness versus Sam Patterson. Now this is an interesting one because I see a lot of people taking Sam Patterson because he's an underdog against Johan Liness. I completely understand the pick. Johan Liness is also not that good, okay? Neither is Sam. Pa Patterson is good because he has really good wins, but I think Sam Patterson has a finishing ability 
that has maybe made him overperform in fights where maybe on a technical level, he's not as good. His finishing ability has kind of saved him in certain moments because he has really good finishing instincts, really good chokes with guillotines, dash chokes, all that, all that stuff. Um, I like Sam Patterson's submission game. I think it's easier for Sam, it's easier for Johan Liness to avoid what Sam Patterson can finish him with than it is for Sam Patterson to avoid what Liness can finish him with. That's what I'm basing this fight off of. Sam Patterson, he has to force a game on Johan Liness to submit him, or Johan Liness needs to shoot a terrible takedown and get submitted. He might do that, but it's going to be on Liness's mistake or in Sam Patterson forcing it on him, which I don't think he can against a larger Liness. Remember, he's moving up to 170 here. He's already a big lightweight, so he's not going to be a small dude, but he's moving up a division here, so I don't think he's going to be muscling around Johan Liness. Johan Liness, strong, powerful, dangerous. Sam Patterson is so open to overhand lefts and rights on the chin. The way he throws punches, just leaving his chin up there in the air. Longest neck in the world. Dude's built to get slept. That's all I'm going to say. I know it's sad to hear that, and it is worrying. I do hope he wins, because I do think he's good, and he's sort of like a big Jack Shaw. But he's kind of built to be slept, unfortunately for him. Um, so I'm going to go Johan Liness. I think he's going to find the KO. He's fighting in front of his home crowd in Canada. Sam Patterson got brutally KO'd in his last fight as well. Now he's moving up to fight heavier hitters and he's given a massive power puncher in Johan Liness. That's worrying to me. What are these managers doing? Oh, you just got KO'd brutally at lightweight. Let's move up a division and fight a guy whose only way to win is by brutal KO. I just don't understand the decision making of managers in this sport or fighters in this sport. It makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, I'm going to go with Johan Liness. I think he's got a solid chance to land some massive overhands on Sam Patterson. And Patterson, even in his fight with... Uh, I'm going to find the, the guy's name right now because I was re-watching it earlier on Brave. He actually went through the like a really tough test or two. He went to fight in Brave and fought Kamil Magomedov. He fought Kunkar Osmayev. He fought some pretty decent fighters. Uh, not Osmayev, sorry. Uh, Sensi, uh, there's another guy, Dijroon, he fought as well at Brave CF. He fought some pretty good opponents over at Brave. Um, I just think that his finishing ability, you know what I mean? He gets a guillotine choke on Magomedov when Magomedov goes for a takedown. Before that, though, I was watching the fight with Magomedov. He was just getting tagged over and over again with overhands. And I think that's what... Um, in the comment section of that very fight on YouTube, a guy was like, Yanal Ashmuz must have seen these openings. And he put a bunch of timestamps. Go and watch it. Brave CF on YouTube. Sam Patterson versus Kamil Magomedov. Guy in the comment section put a bunch of timestamps saying this is where Yanal Ashmuz saw that he could land the overhand on um, Sam Patterson. And you can watch through the timestamps. You can see exactly what he's talking about. Patterson's head head right up in the air, chin wide open, hands down by his side in the middle of exchanges. I don't like that against a guy like Johan Liness. We move on to the prelims. Gillian Robertson versus Pollyanna Viana. I'm going to go Gillian Robertson. Now, are both of them not good? Yes, neither of them are really that good. Um, so I'm not going to say, well, she's so good at this that she'll beat Pollyanna Viana. This is going to be a short breakdown one, I think that Gillian Robertson is a little bit more committed to her game than Pollyanna Viana. I think Pollyanna Viana, and I hate to say this because it does sound demeaning, but this is the case with a lot of with a lot of people in women's MMA, a lot of uh, female fighters in women's MMA. They realize they're potentially somewhat hot. They get they're in MMA anyway. They've got some kind of training, and she's sort of using it as a sort of gateway to her social media and. You know what I mean? I just don't see training out of Pollyanna Viana, to be honest with you. In her last fight, she looked terrible. Now, I know Gillian Robertson did as well. But fact is, Pollyanna Viana hasn't won a fight against anyone good. And she's been in the UFC since 2018. Lost to JJ Aldridge. Beat a 6-5 and five Maya Stevenson. Whatever. You know what I mean? 2019, lost to Veronica, uh, Veronica Hardy. Lost to Hannah Cyphers. Um, beat Emily Whitmire, who was 4-5. and five. You know what I mean? Like these records, Mallory Martin 7 and 5, Poly Pollyanna Viana beats her. Pollyanna Viana gets a win over now 11 and 10, Jin Yufre. Like 
anyone good she loses to. And I think Jillian Robertson is a slight step above absolute bottom feeder trash. So I'm going to go Jillian Robertson. I think she's slightly better. And I think she's going to be able to get top position safely in this fight. I don't see her getting subbed by Pollyanna Viana. And I think that's the only chance Viana has of winning. We move on. To another fight, Serhi Sidi versus Ramon Taveras. I'm going to get called dumb for this. But you know what? I'm not playing it safe this year. I'm not playing it safe this year. If I feel like an underdog's going to win, I'm going with an underdog. And I know a lot of people right there are like, no way is he picking Ramon Taveras. Serhi Sidi won by TKO against him in his very last fight. This is a rematch, by the way, because on the Contender Series, Sidi dropped Tavares really badly. Not badly, dropped him off balance, and the referee stepped in. Really early stoppage, so they're making the rematch in the UFC because Tavares came back on the later week of the Contender Series and won by KO. Brutally, by the way, against a dangerous guy um, with a good record on the Contender Series. Now, Sidi... This is why I'm picking the guy that lost on the Contender Series. Although he got dropped, I want to go through a few things that I no noticed in that matchup. And that I've noticed in all of his matchups as well. One, when it comes to specifically the matchup they had against each other. Don't care how you break it down. I know he lost by TKO on technicality because he did get dropped off balance. It was an off-balance knockdown. If you watch back the fight and see when the knockdown happened, you can see Tavares stepping in with his lead leg to throw a shot and accidentally stepping on the heel of Sidi. His ankle rolls a little bit. He starts losing balance off to his right, and it plants him straight in position to be hit by the right hand of Sidi, which knocks him off balance backwards. He's completely fine on the ground. The referee jumps in and stops the fight prematurely, which is why he's now got another shot at Sidi. Um, also in that fight, though, something you have to admit if you've watched it, Tavares just looks way better than him on the feet, man. He just does. Looks way better than him on the feet. Way, way better than him on the feet. Way crisper with his striking. Way better boxing. I also like it when there's two low-level guys that aren't really that good. The guy that leads the dance. Tavares was leading the dance in that fight. He was the one pushing forward, backing up City early. I also like the mentality difference that they're going to have. Uh, Tavares feel like he got robbed. He's going to go out there and make a statement and prove everyone wrong about the last fight that he had. City just beat this guy. Feels like he got robbed of a TKO win, which probably wouldn't have happened because it looked like Tavares was pretty conscious on the ground. Um, but City's now like, ugh. Now I've got to fight this guy again? I just beat him. I just beat him. Now I've got to fight him again in Canada? Ugh. Anything, like, why would you want to fight the same guy twice? It's going to be hard for him to be motivated for that compared to Tavares. And by the way, Tavares, pure boxer. City can grapple a little bit better. Tavares has been moving to a super gym. Before his fight with City on the Contender Series in the first place... He actually went to Team Alpha Male and he used to train at a very much smaller boxing gym. Now he's training at Team Alpha Male at a much better gym. I think that's going to be the difference where he's going to make those improvements, whereas City has been at the same gym. So I'm going to trust that change of gym to a super gym for Tavares to make those improvements. And I just genuinely think he's way better than City. I've watched all of their fights. I know he got dropped and it was called a TKO. But he's way better. His boxing is better. He's more aggressive. He's more tough, in my opinion. I know he got dropped, but hear me out. Way faster, way more crisp with his shots, boxing way better. He stuffed to take down early against City in their fight on the Contender Series as well. And he was pushing him back the whole time. So I'm actually going to go with the underdog, which is unexpected of Tavares because I've actually done my research and watched his fights. I'm going with him. We move on. Up the card, Charles Jordan versus Sean Woodson. I'm going with Charles Jordan over Sean Woodson. I think this is a little bit of a no-brainer. I am worried about the... Nine-inch reach advantage of Sean Woodson over Charles Jordan because he's built like Mike Wazowski. Like, this guy's got the weirdest body type you've ever seen in your entire life. He's a freak show um, in a in the kindest way. I'm saying, I'm not saying, like, you know what I mean? He's really weirdly built. Really, really weirdly built. Um, and Charles Jordan, I think he's just better. I think he's better than him. And Sean Woodson has had fights with people that, in my opinion, just aren't even UFC level. And I know it sounds crazy for a guy that's been in the UFC at, since 2019 to be fighting people that aren't UFC level. But in the US, there's a lot of people that get into the UFC that aren't UFC level. I hate to keep bringing up George Hardwick, but just an example of other people from around the world, even guys like Saladin Palanas in, in Europe, I know he just lost moving up to welterweight after taking the featherweight and the lightweight belt at KSW. Like, 
Guys around the world have to do way more. And a lot of the opponents on Sean Woodson's record, 8-4 and four, Dennis Bezuka. He wins that fight. Well done. You know what I mean? Other fights that he's had. Luis Saldana, 16-7. and seven. Dropped him twice and then went to a decision by draw because Saldana got a point taken away because he threw an illegal near. I don't like the chin of Sean Woodson. I think he can be knocked out. And I think Charles Jordan in his recent fights, I mean, some of the other opponents here, Yusuf Salau's now 10-5. and five. You know, Colin Anglin was fighting Sean Woodson. He's 8-3. and three. Like, US really do just be letting anybody through, to, use, to say it as best I could there. Um, I'm going to definitely go with Charles Jordan. One thing I've noticed in his game that he's changed is his shot selection. Charles Jordan used to be a little bit of a slinger, if you know what I'm saying. Like, he just used to go for it in fights. Like, head kick and another big head kick and a big straight left hand, another big head kick on the arms. And he kept doing that. And sometimes it works, but in other fights where he fought like Julian Arosa, eventually you get broken by that type of stuff. You know what I mean? Like you start throwing all that, the guy's still there in front of you. And it's all like, oh my God, it's round three and I've given this guy all I have. But now in his recent fights, we've seen from Charles Jordan, patience, maturity, way better submission skills on the ground, which I think is going to be an advantage that he might have over Sean Woodson if it does go to the ground. Um... And I think he's got way better striking and way better shot placement than he had before. Way better shot selection. He's actually lowered his volume and increased his effectiveness, which I think will help him here against Sean Woodson. So I reckon he's going to get a wicked TKO in Canada against Sean Woodson and have that breakout performance he's been looking for. We move on. Up the card. Brad Katona versus Gara Armfield. I'm going to go with Brad Katona, the weirdest accented man in the UFC. I think he's better than Garrett Armfield. Fifth, I think he's one of the more underrated fighters on the uh, in the UFC. Like even going into the contender, uh, the Ultimate Fighter, he's very underrated in that. Very, very underrated. Um, I'm just gonna check now on his record and go through some things for you. Just reading out his record here. Um, beat Magomedov seven and one. Gazmat Magomedov on the uh, Brave. 11-2. and two. Brave is such an underrated organization outside the UFC, by the way. Nikolic, um, he went he went, beat him. He was an 8-0 and o guy at Brave as well. Went on a four-fight win streak at Brave. Won the fights on the Ultimate Fighter. Shouldn't have beaten Timo Valiev, but the fact that it was a close scrap, I like that. Valiev, in my opinion, is like just outside the top 15 at Bantamweight. Like, he's right there. Like, he's top 20, top 25 Bantamweight level in the UFC. So I do value... Uh, Brad Katona here over Gara Armfield. You know what I mean? Also, the guys that he's lost to. I know he lost to Hunter Azure, but Marab. Oh, boo-hoo. You know what I mean? Like, you lost to Marab. Oh, well. You know what I mean? Um, Gara Armfield, on the other hand. Another one of these American guys that just shouldn't be in the UFC, but get in anyway. Um, won his fight against Toshiomi Kazama, who arguably shouldn't have been in there anyway either, because he lost on road to UFC, but just got let in anyway, but not George Hardwick. All good. Um, I'm going to definitely go with... Brad Katona over Garrett Armfield. I do like Garrett Armfield's boxing, but I don't like it in terms of finishing a fight. He won his last fight boxing to a finish. I get it, but I don't trust its consistency. And I think Brad Katona is really autistically tough. And I think that's going to be a problem for Garrett Armfield. Plus, he can mix in takedowns. He kicks really well as well. I'm going with Brad Katona. It's his second chance in the UFC. I think he's going to make the most out of it. I'm going with Brad Katona to win this fight by decision or submission. I might go rear naked choke round two for Brad Katona. We move on to the main card. Arnold Allen versus Movzar Evloev. Uh, we meet again. My old nemesis. You know what? I, I've done my research. I actually think Arnold Allen's going to win. I'm not just picking him. Oh, MMA guru hates Dagestani fighters. It's not about that, man. And I actually hate that there's that sort of... I'm now thinking about that when I was looking at this card to predict. And I've been saying, oh, Evloev's going to win, Evloev's going to win. Just to sort of get people off my back about picking that matchup. I hate that now. There's that pressure now when it comes to picking a Dagestani's fight for me. Where it's like, oh, he's going to pick against them. Uh, it's not that. I will pick them if I think they're going to win. I've picked them many times before. I do think Evloev's going to lose this one, though. I was watching back his fight with Diego Lopez, and boy, are there some massive openings on the feet when he throws punches, you know. There are some big openings on the feet when he throws punches. Now, I don't think Alan has the jiu-jitsu skills of Diego Lopez, but I do like his 
grappling ability compared to Diego Lopez when it comes to getting back up to his feet and wrestling in general. Really good transitions, really good scrambles. He rolls very well with certain things. There's also certain times people when they're wrestling in defense, they sort of try and, uh, what's it called? Go against the movement of their opponent. And sometimes Dagestanis, especially with their grappling style, they like that. You know what I mean? They like the momentum-based grappling where they take you one way, you try and go another, and then they hit a switch on you. And all of a sudden you're on the canvas. I feel like Arnold Allen knows when to go with certain grappling moments. You know what I mean? He'll go loose on the feet and let his weight drop to the floor, like Whitaker was doing against Yoel Romero in their first fight in Australia, UFC 213, I believe, if my memory serves me correct. Um, either way, Arnold Allen, Movzar Evloev. I'm going to go Arnold Allen, and I'm not just picking him because he's English versus Dagestani, and I know there's going to be a uh, salt, 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 lol, you should have picked Dagestani, you keep hating on them if it doesn't go this way, but he's an underdog here, I think this is like a 50-50 matchup, I'm leaning towards Arnold Allen after doing my research, Movzar Evloev, here's why I'm not picking him to beat Arnold Allen, if he wasn't coming off a brutal ACL injury after Diego Lopez ripped his leg out of its socket, I wouldn't mind it, you know what I mean, I really wouldn't mind picking him to win this fight, I don't like that for him, he's been out for a while, Lopez has fought so many times since then, Evloev, coming off a really bad injury, like a really bad knee repair after Lopez in May of 2023, not that long out, I'll take that back, in May of 2023, Lopez tore his leg out of place in round three, you know what I mean, you could see him grimacing in that round, and after that fight, immediately he says, I'll be ready for July, UFC 290, UFC put me on, all of a sudden we don't hear from him, and I was actually watching a weird clip on Twitter of him training Sneeko to grapple, um, and he actually mentioned in the video, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm actually coming off a leg injury right now. And he started pointing to his knee where he had a brace on. And this was a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, maybe something like that. Maybe it was an old footage. Maybe he's like, he's good on his knee, but he still mentioned that he's hurt his knee. And I know he had to have his leg fixed after that fight with Lopez. So I don't like that for his grappling. He's definitely not going to have better grappling after his ligaments are gone in his knee. Um, so that we're not going to get the best Evloev here that we're ever going to get. And te definitely when it comes to grappling. And when it comes to Arnold Allen, he moves very well backwards. Other fighters that have fought Evloev don't do that well. Dan Ige is not the stick and move on the outside type of guy. He plants and throws. And when you're Evloev and you're shooting double legs at distance or... Him and Dan Ige were going forward and backwards. Forwards and backwards. And Ige doesn't move backwards very well. And that's where Evloev was getting him good. He was making him go forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. Ige would come in and plant, double leg. Evloev would get him to the ground. Arnold Allen moves backwards very well. Very dangerous with hooks on the back foot. Extremely dangerous. That's where Lopez caught Evloev up against the cage. When Lopez's back was to the cage, by the way. Allen also moves very well side to side. I want to say it's laterally. He moves very well side to side, doesn't just go forward and backwards like other people that Evlo ever su has succeeded against in the grappling. Um, Allen's very good at counter grappling, hasn't been taken down in, I mean, I think he looked better against Nick Lentz in the grappling department. And before you tell me, oh, that was a while ago, the very next fight, Evlo ever fought Nick Lentz and they had a bit of a scramble or two and it went to a split decision, by the way. And Allen shut down all nine of Nick Lentz's takedowns. I do worry about Allen maybe not doing enough damage and maybe Evloev overwhelming him to a decision. So either way, I think if Evloev wins, it'll be very close. But I am going to go Allen. Moves very well side to side on the back foot. Moves around the outside of the octagon. We're in the larger octagon now as well. I think he's going to beat Evloev. With moving around, moving around, making Evloev come to him and then catching him with a counter hook as Evloev throws his punches because I've been watching Evloev's fights. His punches are just not good. They're not powerful. Maybe this will make me eat my words because he's Dagestani and I'm, they're just out to get me at this point against my picks. Um, power, it's not there. And I know Arnold Allen's not really a crazy finisher, but he does have some really serious sting in his shots. Evloev's power is just not there. And the way he throws his punches, look at him throw straight punches against Lopez. He is so unbelievably close to try and throw those punches unbelievably close to Lopez trying to land those shots. Chin up in the air at times. I think Allen can move side to side, move on the back foot, wrestle defensively well, and land those hooks on Evloev when he needs to. 
I think he's going to drop Evloev in moments, not finish him, but drop him enough to win this fight on damage. I'm going with Arnold Allen, 29-28. I like his side-to-side -side movement. Ige was moving forward and backwards. That's where Evloev succeeded. Other opponents have moved side-to-side -side on Evloev, and he hasn't been able to get the same level of takedowns. Allen's never just stood there with his back up against a cage, like, oh God, is it going to be a takedown or a punch? He's always moving, and when you move like that, the double legs of Evloev, they're not the same. He's not getting the same connection to your hips. You know what I mean? He's just not. You're already swiveling. You're already swiveling your hips. You're already at an angle when he shoots in and it helps you sprawl. I'm going with Arnold Allen getting this one done by 29-28 decision. I think I broke it down very well. It's not a biased pick, but now that's going to plague me whenever I pick against one of these guys. Either way, I like Evloev as well, but it's just... I, I think Alan wins, and he's an underdog. I'm taking that any day. We move on. Chris Curtis versus Marc-Andre Barriot. I'm going with Chris Curtis here over Marc-Andre Barriot. Marc-Andre Barriot. I've actually done a lot of research for this card, and I hope you guys appreciate it. I'm really trying to hammer home some research for these cards. I've been watching a lot of fights. Watched a lot of Marc-Andre Barriot fights. He has moments, and this is what Marc-Andre Barriot's fights often come down to when you noticed it. Um, when you watch him, sorry. He starts losing, and then he overwhelms people with volume. Where they're swinging on him up against the cage, he's rolling and moving with shots, or he's taking shots on the chin, and eventually they start gassing out, and he starts overwhelming them and pouring it on in the second or third round. Chris Curtis's body shots. Seen a lot of opponents... A lot of opponents having Marc-Andre Barriol up against the cage. They do not go to the body like Chris Curtis. Curtis isn't going to have to worry too much about grappling here against Marc-Andre. It's going to be a stand-up fight. I think that will give him a lot of opportunity to move forward and march him down. Stay within himself. Stay within his guard. I don't really rate the power of Marc-Andre too much. So I don't think Curtis is going to have to worry in that department. I think he has a power advantage over Marc-Andre. And I just love the pressure, the body shots. I think Extreme Couture are going to have a hell of a motivation boost after Strickland became champ. Um, I think Chris Curtis is going to track him down, find the body on Marc-Andre Barriol, and start ripping into the body of Marc-Andre Barriol up against the cage when they do have those momentum shifts. Because in every Marc-Andre Barriol fight, you can go through them. They're close. You know what I mean? They're competitive scraps that he gets into with people. The Eric Anders fight was a close competitive fight. I don't think Anders is anywhere near the level of Chris Curtis. Anywhere near, especially when it comes to going to the body up against a cage and his boxing pressure in general. The fight with Julian Marquez, they scrapped. They scrapped it out. I don't like that. I think Chris Curtis is going to beat him if they get scrappy. I don't like Andre's finishing ability. And I think he's going to get finished up against the cage with body shots. I'm going to say late round two or round three for Chris Curtis. We move on. Up the card, Neil Magny versus Mike Mallett. I just realized Chris Curtis and Sean Strickland are going to be at the same press conference. That's going to be pretty cool. Neil Magny versus Mike Mallett. You know what? I'm going to go with Mike Mallett. I was, gonna, I was honestly hedging the idea of picking Neil Magny here. Dumb? Maybe. In hindsight, maybe it was dumb. I, I think I need to start taking into consideration that some of these older fighters, uh, just because he beat Jeff Neal once, doesn't mean he's always going to be of that level. And doesn't mean Jeff Neal's always going to be of that level. I need to stop doing that. That's something I've noticed I do a lot with my predictions. I say, well, he lost to this guy in 2021. Not realizing that this guy's 34 and now he's 37. And the guy who lost that I'm sh trashing for losing was 24. He's now 27. You know what I mean? Like, Neil Magny, the last fight he had. If there's ever a fight that happens that makes you feel like you're not good enough to be here anymore. It's that Ian Gary fight. Not to mention going into this mentally. Mike Mallett fighting in Canada. He's already fought in Canada, I'm pretty sure. If I'm not mistaken, I'm just going to double check that right now. Um, UFC 289. Maybe I'm off on this, but I swear, didn't he fight in Canada before? He did. Olivera Dariush was in Canada. Yeah, it was on the same card. Okay, so he's already fought in Canada. And I trust his pressure. I trust the nerves not to get to him. He was on the main card before. He had a great performance. He has beaten absolute cans. That's That much we know. He's beaten absolute cans. But he knows the game plan. Chew up the calf of Neil Magny. Chew up the legs. He has got some decent low kicks as well. And then find the submission when Neil Magny's on the ground after he's been butchered by your legs. 
I think Mike Mallett's going to find himself like an arm triangle on Neil Magny in round two after chewing up the legs in the first two rounds. I think Magny's legs aren't going to be the same after that fight with Ian Gary. I think he's going to go in there a little bit hesitant, wince after a couple of them, knowing that that pain might return from the fight with Ian Gary. I'm going to go Mike Mallett. I'm going to trust in his improvement. I'm going to trust in his commitment to the game. And also Neil Magny mentally, as I just said about the pressure of Mike Mallett, and I like it because he's already fought in Canada on the main card in front of his home crowd. Neil Magny, custody battle right now for his kid. It's tough. Tough thing to go into a fight thinking about. So I'm going to go with Mike Mallett. I reckon he'll get this one done by submission. Yeah, I'm not taking the underdog of Neil Magny. We move on. Up the card to another fight, which is Raquel Pennington versus Mayra Bueno Silva. I'm going with Mayra Bueno Silva over Raquel Pennington. I think her finishing potential is just way higher than Raquel Pennington. I know she tested positive against Holly Holm, but hey, if she's on the source, I like my pick even more. You know what I mean? I'm not going to even use that to say, oh, well, you know, she's on the source, so she's going to lose. No, I like it when it comes to my picks. She was losing to Holly Holm in that fight. Eventually got a submission. I'm going to double check what that submission was because I watched it a while ago. I think it was some kind of weird... The reason why I'm not knowing the submission because I think it was some kind of really weirdly angled standing dust choke type thing. I'm going to say. I'm going to find out what it was. I hope it doesn't just say no contest overturned. Uh, it does just say no contest overturned. I'm not going to be able to go to the fight footage right now, am I? Well, she got a weird choke up against the cage, but that's what I like about her, the finishing ability that she has. Raquel Pennington got kind of easily pushed up against the cage by Holly Holm. I like the finishing uh, ability of Mayra Bueno Silva. And I was watching back her fights. Raquel Pennington's good at boxing. She's got crisp hands. She knows what she's doing. She's a veteran. She's experienced. This is Mayra Bueno Silva's big moment. Pennington's had these moments before. She's had a much longer career. Mera Bueno Silva, one of her more underrated performances that I want you guys to go and check out. The Manon Fiorot fight that she had. I'm going to go to UFC stats right now, um, just to remind myself. But it was a lot more of a competitive fight than a lot of people remember. Manon Fiorot is a very good women's flyweight fighter. I know Mera Bueno Silva is a little bit bigger than her, but still. What I'm saying is, technically, when it comes from a technical standpoint in that fight, she actually looked pretty good in that fight. And she had moments where she actually hurt um, Manon Fiorot to the body. Manon outlanded her in the fight. Don't get me wrong. Picked her apart at range. But Mayra was landing the better shots in the fight in moments. And she did have a moment where she did hurt Manon to the body quite badly. Now, she did get beaten up. But I saw potential in that so at the end of the day, I think that Mayra Bueno Silva does have a much higher finishing potential than Raquel Pennington. And I think she's going to end this fight in round two with a knee bar and become the women's bantamweight champion of the world. Yes, that's the situation we're at right now in the women's bantamweight division. Second round, knee bar submission, Mayra Bueno Silva. We move on to the main event. Sean Strickland versus Drickus Duplessis. The moment you've all been waiting for. I'm going with Sean Strickland by Brutal KO. Drickus is a fraud and he's going to be exposed. I'm joking. Drickus Duplessis, in my opinion, is going to win this fight by TKO or submission. I see this happening at some point in the second round or maybe late in the first. I think he's a really good style matchup to beat Sean Strickland. And I do like Sean Strickland. I'm a big fan of Sean Strickland. I think he's a very technical fighter. But I'm noticing a trend in his career against certain opponents that do things that Adesanya does and other opponents that do things that Drickus Duplessis does. And I think there's a stark difference between them. Drickus Duplessis does things that make Sean Strickland fights either very close or make him lose fights. Sean Strickland does very well when you allow him to walk forward, get comfortable get his teep going, get his jab going, and start to build a snowball effect. Drickus Duplessis does not often let people walk him backwards. When they're grapplers and they have the ability to try and grapple against him, he often does end up backing up against the cage because he's a little bit more hesitant about rushing in with punches over the top with his hip square in case he gets met with a double leg against like a Derek Brunson. But with his new nose... With his improved cardio that we saw in the Whitaker fight, I reckon we're going to see Drickus Duplessis be able to push 
a lot more moving forward, which is the big deal here. And I think that's going to be the key to success for him against Sean Strickland because I think he's a more wild, more unorthodox, and more dangerous version of Jared Cannonier. Maybe he's not as defensively responsible, but honestly, I don't ever see Drickers getting wobbled by Marvin Vittori. So I think maybe he's less defensively responsible than Jared Cannonier, but... I think he's a lot tougher than Jared Cannonier, and he knows that. And when you know things about yourself, you can adjust your game of fighting around your attributes that you have. You know what I mean? If Drickers had a glass chin and he knew it, I bet you he wouldn't be fighting the way that he fights. So I think Drickers Duplessis, the main difference that we're going to see in this fight between this fight and Sean Strickland versus Israel Adesanya, because on paper, people are saying, oh, well, Adesanya beat Pereira. He's a world championship level kickboxer. Of course, he's a better striker. Like... It's not the same type of striking. Adesanya does not plant his feet and go forward. He just doesn't. He backs up, waits, tries to throw leg kicks on the back foot, and it works because he's a lot taller and rangier than other opponents. But when Strickland just walked him down, he was able to check the low kicks, push Adesanya backwards with a teep and a jab, Drickus moves forward. Cannonier had a lot of success against Sean Strickland moving forward. And before you tell me, oh, well, Strickland's a different fighter after the Alex Pereira fight. He's a much different fighter after the Alex Pereira fight. I do understand that. The Jared Cannonier fight was after the Alex Pereira fight. And he, and I just, I feel like Cannonier exposed a lot of holes in Strickland's game where he doesn't have the same power moving backwards that he does moving forward. Maybe I'll end up being incredibly wrong here, but Strickland is not the type of striker who's going to pull counter and crack you with a right hand, move him backwards and leave you out cold like O'Malley did against Aljamain Sterling. Just not that type of fighter. And Drickus moves forward when people don't grapple. We saw it against Brad Tavares in the later rounds. If you want to talk about cardio of Drickus, even when he had his bad nose and his cardio is a little bit impaired, against Tavares, watch that third round. Watch the third round and the late second. He genuinely just puts it on him and says, you know what? I'm not going to win this fight going backwards. I'm arguably down a round in round one because I failed a takedown and ended up on bottom position. And he just pushes and goes. And the thing is with Drickus, as I said, Cannonier likes to do things technically. It actually hindered him a little bit against Israel Adesanya because he was so within himself. He didn't want to let go and take chances. Cannonier throws shots. Sometimes he holds back on power. Holds back on power because he's waiting to try and be the perfect technical fighter that he wants to be. Drickus, it's technique in his own way. He's got his own style of fighting. I think he's going to be good pushing forward here. Not having to worry about takedowns from him running in with his hips square to his opponent. Throwing punches over the top. I think he's going to be able to back up Sean Strickland. Put shots on him. And one thing I like about Drickus' game... Overextending the punch a little bit is somewhat good, I like. I like that because Strickland is used to, if I throw this, there's a very composed check hook coming back my way. And then after that, there's not really much else that's going to come. Adesanya's probably going to move out and then shift off to the side and go back to leg kicking at range and pop in some shots out there again. Drickus will throw a lead hook and then step forward and throw a left and then a right hand after stepping forward again. And I think with Sean Strickland's style of defense, those multiple shot combos while moving forward and switching your feet like Drickus does, backing your opponent up, I think that's where Strickland is going to get caught by shots because he moves back, he parries at the initial shots and he either looks for his counter shots after that or he plants throws or all of a sudden the... the the striking defense isn't as good as it once was for those initial few shots. So I think we can see situations where Drickus is looking to throw, standing in the center of the octagon, trying to push Sean Strickland back. Strickland will throw something as a bait. Drickus will throw a hook back. Strickland will back up, parry it a few times, but then Drickus will step through and throw a left, then step through and throw a right, fully extended, his full weight behind it, all at the end of his punch, and that's where he's maybe going to catch a Strickland after a couple of parries, like, oh God, a little bit flustered, moving backwards. Also, another thing that I want to point out for Drickus here, I think he has the opportunity to stop the offense of Sean Strickland. Now, I like Sean Strickland's grappling, but I think a grappling threat for Sean Strickland drastically changes the fight. Even if you think Drickus won't get a takedown, the Hamanson fight wasn't a good performance from Strickland. Again, before the Pereira fight, he got KO'd, learned from Pereira's ways and become way better. I get it. He did improve. But 
the implementation of grappling and a grappling threat, even if it's not successful, makes a Strickland fight way more competitive for lesser strikers than Drickus Duplessis. Jack Comanson is he's got some kicks on the feet, but he's just not a striker, is he? He's not a dangerous KO artist striker like Drickus Duplessis is. And he mixed in takedowns, didn't get them, but it made Strickland respect him and not put weight behind his shots and not have the same uh, urgency to try and walk him down and build volume and build momentum. So I'm going to go Drickus. I think he's got an advantage. I think he can mix in takedowns if Strickland is ever pressuring him up against a cage. I think the double leg is an opportunity for him. Do I think that he's going to maul Strickland on the ground and beat him up? No, I think Strickland does have good grappling enough. But I think the implementation of it and the idea of it in Strickland's mind might be the difference between perfectly parrying, parrying Adesanya's shots, knowing that there's never going to be a takedown, to, oh God, what's this rush going to be? Is it going to be a one-two into a double leg or a single leg? Is it going to be a one-two into more explosive punches afterwards? And I think that's where Drickus can catch Sean Strickland. So I'm going to say that Drickus catches him late round one, maybe round two, TKO, finishes him off on the ground, Maybe Strickland's still somewhat with it and tries to complain with the referee in like an over-under position afterwards as he's getting back up against a cage. But I think it's going to be a justified stoppage. And we're going to see Drickus drop Strickland into a position that he had Darren Till in. And then from that position, do what he did to Darren Till, but against an already rocked and dropped opponent, which will be the difference maker. Um, so arguably, it could be similar to Strickland versus Adesanya round one, but the knockdown is not going to be a crisp one-two. It's going to be more of like a running switch stance overhand shot on a Strickland who's already parried two shots and is expecting no more to come. So he's trying to throw back and then boom. I'm going to go Drickus Duplessis. think he has an advantage here. Also, the low kicks. Oh my God, there's a lot to discuss. I'm going to do a full breakdown for this as well. I think low kicks are going to be good here. Drickus throws low kicks very well. Even when he rocked Whitaker with a jab, which is crazy to say, but it was more of like a power do-who choice style jab. You know what I mean? It wasn't like a, a regular jab. But even when he rocked Whitaker, what, what's the first shot he went for afterwards? Boom. Massive calf kick on Whitaker afterwards. I think the calf kick is one thing that Drickus can go for. I also think that he can chew at the heavier part of the leg of Sean Strickland. And I think it's a different style of check when you're a striker done it, trying to deal with people's low kicks. The calf kick is something that shocked a lot of people in the game. But now that people have adjusted, they're finding an easier time just sort of turning that shin over or tucking it away like Jose Aldo showed us how to do against Pedro Munoz. With the higher one, I think it's a little different. And I think that's where Drickers can have success to the inside leg, to the outside leg. I think that's going to be a problem for Strickland as well, especially when he's moving backwards and Drickers can throw these low kicks after getting respect on the feet, pushing Strickland backwards and then chopping the low kicks. That's the difference in the low kicks between Adesanya and Drickers and how they can implement them against Strickland. Strickland very good, but I think Drickers is going to get this one done. And if anyone's mentally off in this fight, it's Strickland. Crying on a podcast. I'm not roasting him. You can cry, whatever. Not roasting him. Do what you want. The cr we don't see this from Strickland, man. He just achieved his dreams. The chip on his shoulder, I feel like it's kind of gone. He's living that sort of movie-style lifestyle, getting into fights in the crowd. Normal stuff, whatever. It's just if anyone is a little different mentally going into this fight, it's Strickland, not Drickus Duplessis. So I'm going to go with Drickus Duplessis, getting it done by TKO. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Toodle pip. See you later. Goodbye.